do that. Where's Cassie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Cassie. Well, let's uh, let's do this. I'll quickly introduce myself. I have, uh, as of July, I retired um, after serving as the executive director of the Phipps Center for the Arts for over 35 years. Um, and I have been, uh, uh, this is my second term on the Arts Board. I think it's the fifth year. Um, and I uh, thoroughly enjoy chairing this panel. Uh, it's uh, always very, very uh, informative and enlightening, and, uh, and uh, I look very forward to your comments. So, uh, Carrie, do you want to tell us about yourself? Uh, certainly. Um, Carrie Ronander. I am the director of Chippewa Valley Museum up in Eau Claire. Um, this is the first time I've served on this panel. I did serve on an arts board panel years ago, but I don't remember what I actually did. And it was too long ago. It's way in the past. Um, so I've been at the Chippewa Valley Museum, which is a general history and culture museum for 20 years, um, but a director for five years. And so most of my background is as a curator of general history. Um, I've also exhibit work here at the museum, working with folk artists um, in that capacity. And this has been an experience. Um, it's just been a wild week in so many, so many regards. So this will be fun. Thank you, Carrie. Jan, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. uh, I'm, I'm Jan Smith. Uh, I just retired as well, John, uh, um, as um, executive director of Bergstrom Mahler Museum of Glass. Uh, I was there in that capacity for uh, 14 years and um, uh, prior to that, I had been the executive director of um, Rar West Art Museum for seven and a half. And before that, I was curator at Bergstrom Mahler Museum. So um, uh, I've recused myself from that discussion, but uh, <laughs> with, with that extensive history, um, have um, been an applicant and participant in um, Wisconsin Arts Board, either panels or uh, on the other side, uh, asking for money since uh, uh, long ago when I, uh, probably in the 80s, when I began my career working at um, the Monroe Arts Center. So uh, as, a, as their first part-time only staff person. So it's kind of fun to take a look at some of these and just see how organizations have grown over these years and, yeah. and what they've accomplished and just the, the um, amazing um, uh, wealth and richness of our arts across the state. Thank you, Jim. Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay Giese with I'm the executive director for River Arts Inc. in Prairie du Sac. Um, we are, although when I apply for grants, we're in the presenting category. Um, our organization has evolved like many others. And um, so we are multidisciplinary today. And so we have a performing arts series. Um, we have an exhibit space in one facility and then a um, more retail gallery shop for local artists in another facility. Uh, and a concert series there. Um, and a couple years ago, we started doing a lot more art class programming. So a little bit of everything. And then on the side, I also um, am a singer. So I do still perform. Not now, but. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Adalia. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Adalia hernandez Alpergo. I currently work at Dane Arts. Um, this is my first time serving as a panelist for Wisconsin Arts Board, but um, I feel like I've had my fair share of staffing the Dane Arts grant cycle, so uh, <laughs> looking forward to this. Um, previously, I worked at the Wisconsin Union Theater, um, managing their classical music concert series, and I did my undergrad in piano performance. Oh. Thank you, Dahlia. And Jim. Good morning. I'm Jim O'Connell. I, uh, I currently teach at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in the arts management program. As a matter of fact, I'm the only one who teaches in the arts management program. Um, uh, Lindsay, uh, one of your former uh, student employees, uh, uh, Garrick Hartley, is one of my students now. And he speaks so very highly of you. You should know you're an inspiration to him. Uh, 
in the uh, I'm starting my seventh year teaching and uh, the previous 22 were spent managing the Performing Arts Center, the Grand Theater in Wausau, Wisconsin. And uh, I have a total of about 47 years in the in the presenting slash facility field. And I was on, I believe, the first creation and presentation grant panel in 2008. I believe I was back in either 2009 or 2010. And for the last few years, Karen has asked me to uh, to look at the very few new uh, applicants uh, that are off cycle uh, when there are somewhere between eight and 13 of them. And uh, so I've, I've been involved in this program for some time and uh, used to be an applicant to it. Uh, I like it very much. God bless you, Jim. Karen. <laughs> Karen, what's next? So um, I will introduce myself and then Caitlin and Dale and then George, if you'd like to say something, oh, that would be awesome. Uh, thank you, John Potter. Uh, I'm Karen Geshko. I am the uh, assistant director at the Wisconsin Arts Board. And I am, I can't even tell you how delighted I am to have the five of you as a panel. Um, the perspectives that you bring um, and, the, and the fact that you were able to bring them all the way through to today, um, uh, in spite of this crazy time that we are living in, despite the fact that you are not sure what's going to be happening in some cases with your organizations or uh, your your world or whatever, is unbelievably humbling. Uh, and I I am so grateful to you guys. So thank you for the time that you have spent so far, and that the time um, that we are sharing today. I'm I'm looking forward to the conversations. Um, Caitlin, would you mind uh, jumping in and saying hi? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Caitlin Burrell. I'm the Folk and Traditional Arts Coordinator here at the Arts Board, and I'm really just here to listen today and, and troubleshoot if we need it. I'm usually the, the runner for lunch and uh, anything else we need on these days. So my job is pretty easy today, but I'm just uh, grateful for your all's time and, and glad to join you this way. Thank you. Hey, Dale. Yeah. My name is Dale Johnson. I'm the Grants and Information Specialist here at the Arts Board, which means I like to work in the background and handle the data systems, and I'll be keeping track of the scores for you today. Thank you. And George. Well, so I have magically appeared. <laughs> uh, or at least your GT I did. Wanted, yeah, right. So I'm George Sugros, the director of the Wisconsin Arts Board and adding my voice to the already many, many thank yous and there probably aren't enough thank yous uh, for what you're doing and what you have done to get to this day. Um, there is no doubt that the applicants value your comments constructive as we know they will be. So um, we look forward to the day. I'll, I'll be jumping in and out as I, I'm actually also attending a conference um, today. And I just want to say that in this uh, virtual world that we're working in it adds both a layer of um goodness because you can all be together because you otherwise couldn't be and then it also adds a challenge so thank you in advance uh for putting up with the challenge of technology and i wish you all on your day thank you george um does everybody have, I, I think I'll ask this uh, after the orientation, John, but I'm going to make sure that everybody has access to your comment sheets again um, now that you have submitted the initial reviews um, of all of them. So we'll go through that tech step at the end. But uh, but right now, let's go ahead and, and run the orientation script, uh, John, and then we can take questions and stuff. So this is like reading the Miranda rights. <laughs> and and I will say that the reason that we do this, and thank you for your patience, everybody, is just to make sure that all of the panels are um, are oriented in the same way, so that we have consistency and we don't forget important things. So Karen and I will share this. I'll start with the Wisconsin Arts Board in brief, although it's lengthy. <laughs> The Wisconsin Arts Board, established in 1973, is the state agency which nurtures creativity, cultivates expression, promotes the arts, supports the arts and education, stimulates community and economic development, and serves as a resource for people of every culture and heritage. 
Our vision is inspired by a quote from the late Robert E. Gard, Professor Emeritus of Community Theater, University of Wisconsin. Quote, if we are seeking in America, let it be for the reality of democracy and the arts. Let art begin at home and let it spread through the children and the parents and through the schools and the institutions and through government. And let us start by acceptance, not negation, acceptance that the arts are important everywhere and that they can flourish if they can exist and flourish in small places as well as large, with money or without it, according to the will of the people. Let us put firmly and permanently aside the cliché that the arts are a frill. Let us accept the goodness of art where we are now and expand its worth in the places where people live." End quote. We embrace this vision. It guides our belief that the arts are basic to human life and essential to the human spirit. The Wisconsin Arts Award values imagination, creativity, curiosity, freedom of expression, respect and appreciation for all cultures and people, artistic quality, a broad definition of the arts, audience and patron development, and community engagement. A major portion of the agency's biennial appropriation from the, from the Wisconsin State Legislature is distributed to eligible artists and nonprofit organizations in the form of matching grants. Additional funds for grants are also allocated to the Arts Board by the National Endowment for the Arts of Federal Agency. The board itself consists of 15 voting members who are appointed by the governor of Wisconsin. These members serve without compensation for a minimum of one three-year term. Members of the board are responsible for establishing the agency's policies and programs and for approving all grant awards. The board meets a minimum of four times per year all meetings are open to the public. The board employs an executive director. As the chief administrative officer, the director supervises the board staff, programs, and day-to-day -day operations. The agency's full-time program and support staff implement policies and programs, including grants, and provide technical and informational services to the public. And the aims. Yes, hand that baton. The aims and objectives of this particular program panel. So the Creation and Presentation Grants Program provides artistic program and operational support to established nonprofit arts organizations whose primary mission is to create or present ongoing arts programming that makes a significant local, regional, or statewide impact on the cultural life of Wisconsin and furthers the Arts Board's community development and arts education goals. The goals of this particular Hello? program specifically are to promote Hi, and Mom. sustain art of the highest artistic quality, to promote and sustain organizational and financial stability, to ensure appropriate long range planning, ongoing assessment and evaluation, community input, and sound promotion as approaches to increasing the effectiveness of arts organizations. Uh, to increase local, regional, and statewide leadership among arts organizations in Wisconsin, to increase audience participation and appreciation of uh, programs created and presented by Wisconsin arts organizations, to help arts organizations articulate the value of the work that they do and the impact of that work on community and economic development to their local and state officials and to the people in their community, and finally, to encourage arts organizations to work to enhance arts education efforts in their community. These goals are essential, uh, we believe, to the long-term vitality of the arts organizations themselves. The role of the panelists. Your role today is to provide expert assistance to the Wisconsin Arts Board in its grant-making decisions and to help keep the board informed regarding needs and trends that you see. Today, you will be reviewing grant applications according to established review criteria and making recommendations to the board. We would like you to apprise the board of needs and trends within your field and community, either through your general discussion of applications or in written assessments for board consideration. We would greatly welcome your input and we would value any suggestions and recommendations you would like to make on the whole grant evaluation process. The role of the panel chair. The role of the panel chair is both informational and procedural. The chair is responsible for providing information regarding Wisconsin Arts Board policy 
and ensuring that panel meetings progress in an orderly fashion according to established procedures. The chair is a non-voting facilitator whose job is to ensure that each panelist's point of view is given ample consideration throughout the review of each application. The panel chair convenes the meeting, reviews the board's conflict of interest policy and determines whether possible conflicts exist and guides the panel through the review by serving as timekeeper and discussion monitor. Panelists should focus their deliberations on how each application's proposal meets the established review criteria. The chair may occasionally need to refocus the panel toward that end. Panel discussion should always be constructive, regardless of whether it is positive or negative. At the December board meeting, the panel chair will report the panel recommendations. A written record of these recommendations and a summary of comments will be provided by staff to facilitate this process. Panel chairs will clarify these comments if requested by the board. The chair may also wish to comment on any trends or needs identified by the panel or may make general observations regarding the overall nature of grant requests. We would greatly value constructive comments and remarks on each application. Panel discussion is recorded and made available via audio file to all, all applicants when they are notified of the outcome of their grant application. Yeah, and this is the first time we're recording it in this way. Um, we used to be able to, Dale, thank you, Dale, used to be able to splice the individual pieces uh, and make those little snippets available to the applicants so they had direct access to theirs. But now, now they will get to just find themselves in the mix, I think, is how we'll handle it. Um, <laughs> we'll figure that piece out. Uh, the role of staff in all of this. I can answer technical questions like eligibility issues or whether the applicant submitted the required budgets, did this applicant ask for assistance from me in the grant writing process, grant proposal writing process, et cetera. I can't make any qualitative artistic judgments or tell you what I think of their work. Just to review the criteria again uh, out loud, each application will be evaluated based on the purpose and goals of the creation and presentation program and specifically on the following four criteria areas artistic, educational, cultural value, organizational and financial management, community participation and accessibility, and planning, evaluation, and documentation. In terms of scoring recommendations, um, you will be asked to score each application individually from one to 100, and it is 100, uh, John. <laughs> we were talking about that yesterday. However, However you, you score, please be consistent throughout the day. So don't score hard at first and then get easier or vice versa. Um, watch that two o'clock post eating lull uh, or the highly caffeinated uh, 10 a.m. Uh, hour, you know, however it works for you. <laughs> um, once you do score, uh, the panel sheets, will you'll submit those and, um, and Dale will uh, average the points at the end of the day uh, and um, and announce them. Uh, if an applicant has received less than 50 points total on average, I mean, sorry, uh, 50 points average, um, they uh, that applicant is automatically taken out of consideration uh, for a grant in this year. You will not be asked to deal with dollar amounts um, in the conversation. That is one of our gifts back to you <laughs> in all of this. We do run a formula. What happens next in the process? As noted previously, the panel chair takes the panel recommendations to the full board. After review and ratification of the panel's recommendations by the arts board members at their meeting, applicants will be notified of grant decisions by mid-December. Conflict of interest policy. You have received the conflict of interest form in the unlikely circumstance that you have been asked to review an application of an organization with which you or a person with whom you have a familial relationship are associated, we ask you to withdraw from all consideration of that application. The panel should not take any action on any application which would financially benefit a member of the advisory panel or someone with whom a member has a familial relationship. Panelists should be upfront about their ability to judge an application objectively. The perception of conflict should also be considered and avoided. Awesome, thank you. And then just to note again, um, the recording of the meeting um, and appeals. 
This meeting is being recorded because it's an open meeting. Um, we will not ask observers to identify themselves. We did invite uh, uh, the applicants as well as um, students from Jim's Arts Administration program. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether anyone will take us up on that invitation or not, but if they do, uh, they will keep their cameras and mics muted. And, uh, and thank you all for that, uh, if there are any observers at this point. Um, and Dale will, uh, will help in that process if someone has any technical issues uh, with, uh, with keeping themselves um, invisible or muted. Um, regarding the appeals process, we would like to let you know that an applicant may only make an appeal based on a procedural error and not on the basis of an artistic judgment. So that is the orientation. Piece. And I am closing my thing out here. Okay. All right. So um, we are at a point where we have, we're going to start the first review uh, at, uh, at 830. And so we have a bit of time to go over any technical issues that any of you might be having, um, any questions that you have, and, uh, and to make sure that, Dale, to make sure that you um, can see if you can see um, that the uh, um, initial reviews have been submitted and everyone has access to their um, comment sheets with, uh, with the square for scoring uh, available to you in those sheets. Um, yeah, I just uh, signed in as Jim just as a test here and, and his sheets are there. The blanks are waiting for your final scores. The only little gotcha is you have to make sure to scroll to the very bottom and click the little I agree box before you submit your final review. Otherwise, and when that happens, I should see them. Great. Lindsay, were you going to ask a question? I was. Well, I don't know. If, now maybe it's gone. When I was first introducing myself, there was a um, major echo coming back to me, but I don't hear it when I hear other people speak. And so I just wanted to see if anybody else was having that problem. Thankfully, no. OK. And it's not yeah. doing it now, so I wonder if there was, like, if, I don't know. It's not doing it now, so great. <laughs> Usually yeah. happens when someone signs on and has their speaker on and it just feeds back. Dale, I have a question on the scoring. Um, there are different sections. Um, is, is it, um, is the bottom score dependent on uh, completing all of the individual sections? or uh, and then it's cumulative or can you just put a cumulative score at the bottom? Um, I don't think you have to do anything except score the individual sections. The total will appear. It'll calculate uh, once you or well, you can click save draft if you want it to calculate. Um, and I can't Before remember, do we, do we make that the process? Click I agree, save draft, then you should see your total and then submit. It's been a while, but uh, yeah. yeah. The save draft button will make it total for you. OK, so you so short answer. Um, yes, you score each um, each of the four sections. Yes. And, yeah. OK. Yep. And you and can then click you save draft at any time if you want to. It won't hurt anything. You, it's just the final uh, submit button is when you're all finished. Jim, you had a question. I was just looking for the uh, for the application, and I cannot find it easily in my notes at this point. But somewhere in the middle of the pile, and I apologize for not uh, seeing this before last night. Uh, the budget sheet was was appeared to be there, but it was defective. It would not come up for me, and uh, I'll I'll have that note when when I when we talk about that uh, application, I don't seem to be able to find it. I've, I've got notes electronically and on paper and. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> it just happened on the one application, Jim? Just on the one application. All the others had uh, had financials that came up, but there was one application that where it did not. OK, well, we will make time during the review of that one just to, to make sure that if we can access it, uh, we will give you access to it. I'm just going to make mention of um, my plan right now in uh, the timing of each of the uh, reviews. Um, after the uh, presenter speaks, the first reader speaks for two minutes. Um, I will uh, I will make mention of that, and then after eight minutes, 
with two minutes left in the discussion, I'll mention that as well. And we'll see if that works for you going forward. Thank you, John. One of John's uh, superpowers in all of this as the panel chair is the timekeeper. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and it does, we do understand that it may, as you guys find your stride, you know, in these first applications, they, they might go a little bit longer or the, you know, as the, as you present your first one, you might uh, go over the two minute thing. So this is John just uh, helping you uh, time manage so that everybody's voice can be heard um, in each of the applications uh, reviews. And it is great to, to get your, your voices or your thumbs up or whatever. Um, if you don't have anything to add to the conversation, if you weren't the first or second panelist, it's still nice to get a ditto or a yep, or a huh, I, you know, I missed, I missed that. I wonder, could you talk a little bit more about this? Because uh, I didn't see that when I was reviewing it. That's what the first and second readers um, are there for, to kind of go deeper into the applications um, and maybe catch things that, that you might miss in your, in your review if you're not assigned to those directly. So there's that. We have three minutes. Do you guys want to stretch? Do you need to do anything before we... We hit 8.30 running. <laughs> Please feel free. I will not be leading any yoga practices during the break. I just want to say that that's another one of our gifts to you. But, uh, but, but I do encourage you to, uh, to get up and, and move around. Um, as we were talking in Jim's arts admin class, I think it was in your class um, this week. Maybe it was in another Zoom thing. Sitting is the new smoking. It's just not uh, really all that great for our bodies. So. Put that out there. And I'm going to pop off screen for just two minutes. Awesome. See you soon, Carrie. Yep. Yeah, Jim? At any point in the in the time, just say shut up, Jim. Um, I, I respond well to that. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> not going to happen. Maybe stop talking, Jim. <laughs> just kidding. I do have like an overall like comments and maybe we'll talk about this at the end but and for those of you who have reviewed these before this is probably not a surprise but for me just going through these 44 applications like there's a lot of amazing stuff happening around the state and I was so impressed and inspired and like taking notes I'm like oh that's a good really good idea like that's some really really great stuff um yay my two cents. so I'm so glad you said that, Lindsay, because that's one of the rewards of doing this. That's yeah. the reason I keep coming back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's the reason that we are um, able to, to ask you guys to do it, because we know that there is reward attached to the work, <laughs> for sure. Lindsay, I would love it if you and, and the others um, said that at the end, too, when we are evaluating. You know, John is looking for um, any trends that you see as you go through these uh, reviews. Um, uh, sort of any arcs of, of, of trends um, so that he can share that with the board uh, again at the December meeting. Um, but if you guys, as you're going through an application, have noted something that's really stellar in terms of a practice or whatever, please call it out because um, we really love collecting those best practices and putting them uh, on the website uh, for others to, to learn from. So. Um, you don't always find them. Um, often there's just a overall, yeah, this is great, but every now and then something really pops within an application. So that'd be great. Okay. Oh my goodness. I can tell that we've all been zooming for so long because you all are so good at immediately putting your mic on when you're not uh, when you're not talking. And <laughs> I just let mine roll. <laughs> okay. I have eight. 30. So when we see Carrie again, I think we'll call it uh, a begin. Hey, here. There she is. Awesome. Great. Okay. Well, uh, with that, let us kick off this um, this review. And uh, John, I think we agreed that I would just go ahead and call the names. Uh, and so going to start with uh, the Sheboygan visual artists out of Sheboygan and uh, Jim you are the first reader. Sheboygan visual artists limited 
is, as Karen said, in Sheboygan. It is a small volunteer visual arts organization. Uh, average annual budget of $26,411. Uh, it is on a calendar year, uh, fiscal year. Was founded in 2007 or incorporated uh, uh, and incorporated in 2013. Uh, in a typical in a typical year, it serves 78 artists, 7,800 patrons, 240 children. The uh, SVA is an active and growing network of visual artists and supporters that enriches the community through the visual arts. We exist to empower visual artists through professional development and collaboration, create opportunities for the community to enjoy the visual arts and promote member artists in their work. This is a small but mighty organization. It does an extraordinary number of things with a limited number of folks. Uh, it, works, uh, it works with and through shelters, foster care facilities, the, the Hmong Association. It works with migrant workers, and it, it has used all of, those, uh, all of those areas during the COVID to uh, to distribute free of charge art backpacks. Uh, it provides scholarships from from the uh, scholarships for high school students. Once again, it is a 100% volunteer organization. Uh, this organization never met a good idea. It didn't attempt to bring into being, and for some groups that would be a detriment. For this one, with its all volunteer mindset and its flexible project leader structure. It just works. Uh, the uh, they have they have created they have provided for their members an opportunity to create artworks for a for a hotel. Uh, Two minutes, please. And uh, I think I think I've said everything I need to say about them right now. Great, thank you, Jan. You're our second reader. Oh, and you're muted. Um, I was um, very impressed by this being um, um, a small but uh, mighty uh, arts organization, uh, nimble uh, with its um, small budget, all volunteer force, um, catering to <clears throat> underserved communities and uh, doing a variety of outreach with uh, volunteer talent. Um, the um, um, it struck me working particularly with the homeless, homeless shelters and the, the um, Hmong population in their area. Um, and um, then raising uh, additional funds on their own for um, a series of public Friday events that they were doing. Um, uh, I, I was impressed by reaching out to some rather non-traditional arts audiences as well uh, and, and locations to partner with. So um, I thought they they went through um, some extraordinary measures measures at uh, community engagement um, and uh, really tried to be inclusive for underrepresented populations. Um, so um, I think that's about that's about it. Um, uh, good use of board member skills and and organizing their board to um, provide this, these program opportunities for their calendar year. Thank you. Lindsay, Carrie, Adalia, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'll echo all of the above. Um, both of you alluded to that, the hotel collaboration, which I thought was a very creative opportunity that helped the artists in their, their area. Um, what a big win for them. Um, and as an all volunteer board, um, I think that they do a really good job. It sounds like they have a good division of labor, like they've got different board members in charge of different things, which was great. Um, their report card was really interesting to me how like they um, evaluate each of their events, but then they put together like a promotional page for each person. So I thought that was both an asset, but could be a challenge. And they mentioned this in the um, narrative which i always appreciate when people like are upfront about their challenges um that when a different person each time is in charge of the marketing having that consistency can be difficult um 
but I think I think it's interesting how they're how they're trying to do that. Thank you. I have nothing more to add. I mean, I think all the three that have spoken have really kind of summarized everything I was thinking or could have thought. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Adalia? Yeah, I mean, again, I echo everything that has been said. I also thought it was really fantastic how they um, had some outdoor activities of like painting benches um, outside, you know, especially with being socially distanced. Um, but yeah, no, really great with um, the volunteer board they have. Awesome, thank you. Then I'm going to ask you, Jim, you have something to share, yeah? I do have a best practice to, oh, uh, to suggest. Uh, and uh, Lindsay alluded to it. I think a best practice for small volunteer organizations is this mentorship for new organizers of projects together with the scorecard for event evaluation. Uh, that makes it very clear for somebody who hasn't headed something before what's expected of them. Thank you, that's great. So I'm gonna, this is perfect that we had um, such a, a positive review on the first application because I, I'm going to just remind you that um, uh, uh, if you uh, give this applicant less than a perfect score, and you very well might, um, then please uh, give some indication of, of why that is. So I didn't hear anything negative. Um, um, and if you would like to put that either in writing or within this discussion, that would be fine. Um, and, and when I say negative, just maybe more of a weakness, you know, whatever, um, so that the applicant can understand that piece as well. Um, the, the, the positives and the negatives are always helpful when you're learning about how people perceive your, your organization. So, um, yeah, if not uh, 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 on with voice, then please with, uh, with typing. And just to clarify, um, are we putting those positive comments in the additional comment section or just in the general comments? Uh, generally, uh, wherever you feel that they fit. If there's a if there's a positive comment that, um, you know, alludes directly to the organizational structure, the financial management, stick it there. But if it's just a sort of general wow, you know, or something related to that, then additional comments uh, is a perfect place to put that. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. And Dale, do you want to just let us know when all five are seen or how do you want to do that that yeah i'm seeing all five now awesome Woo. Thank and you. we are off to the races at 8 38 we're ready for the next one that's fantastic okay great thank so, you all so um, we, we go hit, ahead. sorry we hit save and should if we're ready we hit sub, submit final review or is that something that um john or dale do should i hit submit final review or just save the draft submit final yeah review? You have to do the submit. Had you, had you done that, Lindsay? Um, I had I had um, completed the scoring and hit the draft just now. Great. And Dale, that was one of the five that you saw. Yeah, yeah, I see scores but for I all five. I hadn't submitted the draft and or the submit. I hadn't hit submit just now. Save the draft. Oh, so Dale, you see it before she hits submit? Yeah, saving draft must must bring the total forward that I'm seeing. Submitting then just change the status so we have it in the correct status for later. Okay, yeah, we should probably wait till the submit is hit just in case there's any changes at the last minute as people are thinking about some stuff. Um, okay, so the next application uh, before you in the visual arts uh, category, volunteer artists and, and small budget is a Center for Photography at Madison. For Midwest and uh, Adalia. And I'm just looking at a, another monitor, so that's why I'm not looking directly at the camera as I'm reading my notes. That's totally fine. Yeah, so they're based in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, their mission is to connect, educate, and inspire all who create, support, and appreciate photography as a means of personal expression. Um, their membership is about 233 and has continually grown over the years. Um, they've done various projects, like they've co-hosted two bird photography classes with Wisconsin DNR. Uh, they've taught classes at Cambridge Community Program. Uh, they have Photographer of the Month with exhibits and talks and receptions. Uh, they had about 22 workshops with 202 students um, and members of their group get a discount. Um, they also have interest groups where they can 
discuss various genres of photography. Um, they also have a biennial festival that's um, a juried competition as well as a gear sale. Um, and I really appreciated in their supporting materials how they provided um, thorough lesson plans and syllabus, giving summaries of each session. Um, and during COVID, they had some online photography programs. Um, so they were successful to pivot um, virtually. Um, let's see. They have no paid staff, but a really active volunteer base. Um, they have 57 positions filled. Um, and they also have a grant writing committee that was formed in 2019. Um, they've established a youth photography club earlier in February of 2020, um, partnering with the Boys and Girls Club that is um, going to be, I think, put on hold for a bit as they, again, pivot to virtual programming. Um, they're working with Pope Farm to offer nature walks to its visitors. Um, and they also, with their physical studio, they facilitate with printing and film processes, as well as offer their members professional networks. Um, they have two-year planning goals, and um, I thought that it was all, you know, in the SMART method, being specific and measurable. Um, Two minutes. All right, and yeah, I'll stop there then. Did you get to say what you needed to? Yes. All right, great, thank you. All right, Lindsay. All right, I, I echo all of that. I really appreciated how they broke down their list of activities. It was very clear. And after, especially with reading so many applications, it was really nice to, to see that breakdown. Um, they have a very high participation rate of 30% of their members, which I thought was great to share. Um, um, it, I noticed, and I'm, I'm not remembering the specifics, but I made a note that their the, the location of their board, um, the diversity of that I thought could maybe be improved um, because it's more of a regional um, photography group you know so a lot of the members are or the, a lot of the board members are based out of Madison and thought that was maybe an area for growth um, great partnerships with all of the spaces they exhibit at uh, there they mentioned that they're one of few photographic organizations in the Midwest so that's uh, um, it's very important that we have them um, and I thought that they are doing a great job to, to utilize their feedback to influence their programming as well. Clear organizational plan for their size of organization. Uh, and I really enjoyed their annual report. Thank you. All right, other voices in the mix here. They are not, um... They are not unusual in this for this kind of an organization, but in terms of both the focus of their activities and their uh, uh, and the feedback that they seek, uh, they have their they have partnerships that that make sense for them. But in terms of evaluation, it appears that they're inward inward looking rather than outward looking to the to the broader community. Uh, at least the, the broader geographical community. Uh, certainly, with regard to the interest area of photo photography, they are uh, they are expansive. But there's there's a little tension between being a local organization and uh, and being a regional organization, and that shows up in a couple of places. I did notice uh, that they were doing uh, some outreach to boys and girls clubs. Um, and unfortunately, COVID has probably put a damper on that, but um, I thought that was a promising um, addition. I have nothing to add. Great, that's fine. Jim, just to clarify what you said, are you, did I hear um, in terms of evaluation that they, when you say they're more inward focusing, do you mean um, focused on themselves as an organization and the the art form of photography more than how they're connecting with their community uh, on a local or regional level precisely that, that and 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 the evaluation comes 
not exclusively, but largely from the members. And okay, so, got it. So it is a member orientation. Their planning has has a member orientation to it rather than a broader community orientation to it, in spite of the the uh, the, the tangents and and I don't mean that in a negative sense the tangents that their uh, that their outreach activities uh, offer. Um, again, I think it's a really good organization, but but this kind of organization has that has that sort of inward looking, outward looking tension. Not quite to the extent that the community chorus does, but thank you. I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking community choruses too when you were talking about that. All right, good. Thank you. All right, if there are no other comments, then please score them. All the scores are in. Great, thank you. All right, moving to our next application. We have the Association of Wisconsin Artists. And Jim, you are leading on this one again. Sorry, I have to get to it now. That's all right. This is an organization um, based in Clinton, Wisconsin at the moment. On and, and while you're looking, and feel free, we're doing fine on time, I'm going to pull up the map of Wisconsin, which I had meant to um, pull up before, so that I can show you where some of these communities are if you do not know, and you might know, which is awesome, but just in case you don't. Um, if you ask me, I can share my screen. All righty. I have... Uh... I have found my materials, so. Awesome. Please begin when you are ready. The Association of Wisconsin Artists is the new name for an organization that used to be known as the Wisconsin Regional Arts Association, which supported a uh, UW extension program called the Wisconsin Regional Arts Program. And so there were a lot of acronyms in this one, and uh, they have only just changed their name to uh, Association of Wisconsin Artists because uh, apparently Wisconsin uh, Extension, the UW Extension, has discontinued its support for what was the organization they were they were supporting. Um, the uh, the regional arts program dates back to 1940. Um, and uh, it the idea was that the lives of rural families could be enriched by art. Uh, the uh, it began by coaching rural artists. It incorporated this uh, support group incorporated in 1954 with a volunteer board, news leader, and and linked the extension arts to local art clubs and started giving awards. The membership of the organization is four to five hundred. It has had an endowment since since 2000. Uh, it assist it has assisted with 22 exhibitions uh, per year throughout the state, and will be taking that responsibility over in the future uh, once it finalizes a new agreement with the UW Extension. Uh, it has. Um, a bridging generations program, an evening with the arts reception, a teen arts mentor program, which is in cooperation with local organizations. At least one of the local galleries that we uh, review, we'll hear about later, uh, talked about being associated with that program. They have several other programs, and uh, they will perceive a, or they will be taking over the state, uh, the statewide exhibit, which takes place in Madison two out of three years, and in Wausau at the Center for the Visual Arts on the third year. Has a 14-member board, 23 locations around the state, youth programs, and enhanced website. And um, I think that's what I have to say about it. 
Thank you. Two minutes. All righty. Carrie. Okay. Um, so what I noticed when I was, I'm going to be like Adelia, I'm going to be looking at a different screen, um, is that it does reach a lot of places in the state, um, but the board seems much more heavily situated in um, the Madison region. So um, that was one critique. Um, and Sorry, I thought my notes were a little bit more better organized than this. Right, we're fine. Um, it does have a long history. I guess one of the concerns I saw within the narrative is because it does have such a, um, its ability to reach a lot of places was largely dependent, it seemed, on the extension um, cooperation. And so the concern going forward, and it isn't addressed all that well in the narrative, is, is how is that going to play out in the future? Um, they don't have that ability to partner with UW. So how are they going to continue with their programming? Looking backwards, they've done an excellent job and they've been able to do and reach a lot of places. And that's that's the big the big takeaways. Thank you. And thank you for um for differentiating the the question about future and, and looking back. Um as as you all know, this is a, a sort of a retrospective. Um, application where we talk, we ask them to focus on what they have accomplished. Um, and I think that that was a real gift in this year for so many who, as they try to look forward, you know, are like, mm, don't have that crystal ball ever, <laughs> especially this year. But um, so thank you, Carrie, for that. All right, great. Um, other voices in the mix here, please. Um, I have lots of great things to say about what they do, but those have already been said. And so I don't want to appear like the negative Nancy. Or like, I just am trying not to repeat. They are doing wonderful things. Um, but so some um, critiques, I guess, that I found were, um, let's see, uh, where was that note? Um, Oh, and but one one positive was I, I do appreciate when there are specific examples of um, success and they, they mentioned something about a, a youth choosing the career like to go into the arts after a paint pour class. And I just thought that was very sweet. Um, they have a good evaluation process, it sounds like, but I wonder if they because they're exhibiting in all of these other facilities, if they get feedback from those other communities or just the artists who are participating, if that makes sense. Um, and then I enjoyed the, their photos were wonderful and their work samples. Um, sometimes I feel like it's, um, and I don't know if this is too detailed, but, uh, it's a little bit easier to get a snapshot of what an organization does with maybe a photo of an exhibit or especially if they're going to include multiple photos to get the work close up, but then just a, a more zoomed out snapshot of what they're doing. And then the only other like very little thing is that they, in their, um, summary list that's only that 60 artists are directly involved but then in the narrative later i wrote down that they listed that they serve 400 to 600 artists each year and so i just i mean if that's what's happening like that's great let's let's celebrate that as their list of engaged artists so I think there's a problem with the question, and we can talk about that at the end of uh, that that section where you say, "How many people do you serve? Artists, adults, and children?" There is there is a set of problems with that question, which leads to its being distorted, depending upon how it's interpreted. Once again, we'll talk about that at the end. I, I do agree. I've noticed that in a few applications where the numbers were confusing. Thank you, Jim. Uh, part of the tension there, and we'll talk about it as you say at the end, is. Um, what the NEA asks of us and, and what we uh, want to know. So there's a there's a connection that we should um, actually, uh, I will make a point of um, making more seamless uh, in the next time with your help. So thank you. All right, um, Adalia or Jan. Um, Adalia, any comments? I'm sorry. Um, again, yeah, I don't want to repeat um, too much. I think the one critique I thought was that um, there didn't seem to be a lot of long-term goals. Um, it seemed like a lot of short-term, and I feel like long-term would help them, especially when they want to like diversify their community and reach more across the state. Within their organizational plan? Correct, yes. Yeah. And Jan. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, I was I was um, examining their their planning, and it seems like they gather feedback for existing events that help their kind of continuity, but they haven't looked more futuristically at um, how they would sus uh, sustain some of this. Um, but it's pretty impressive in terms of a volunteer network. I thought they pivoted well for the pandemic to even uh, go to the extent of um, offering um, virtual programming um, and actually rallied and added a board position to try to accommodate that. So um, much to their credit, I was, I was kind of amazed at what they could produce um, <laughs> all volunteer. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll turn I'm sorry. Up. Back over you. I'm I'm a little concerned uh, about the willingness of the UW Foundation to give up the hundred eighty thousand dollar endowment that they have there. Uh, institutions like UW Foundation don't like to give up uh, uh, money. On the other hand. Uh, it, it probably has a history, but there there seemed to be a rather, and I it's it's not a criticism, it's a fear that I have for the organization. Uh, there seemed to be a rather um, uh, positive, uh, un, un, unsullied uh, assumption that they were going to receive that money back, and uh, I, I hope they do. I I would just um, clarify that that point. Um, they, they do have very good reason to expect to, to have that money. So, yes. All right, it sounds like the discussion is done and people are scoring and Dale will tell us when they're in. Thank you. Karen, I'm wondering if it would be better if each panelist mentioned when they clicked submit because it's it's clear to me I'm seeing totals when this when the draft button is clicked but I I don't want to transfer them until I know they're they're submitted I'm done thank you done I'm done too finished thank you all all right I think that moves us them. great thank you then this moves us into the uh, Beloit Fine Arts Incubator application from Beloit. And Lindsay, you're our lead on this one. All right. Sorry, my non muted. Okay. Um, the <laughs> Beloit Fine Arts Incubator in Beloit, Wisconsin, their mission is. In partnership with the community and regional artists, we will maintain a center to teach, display and promote art through events, classes, gallery and studio space. Uh, for their strengths um, and just other information, they typically host 28 exhibits, both professional and student shows, plus art classes and traveling exhibits. Um, I, they continue to evolve as an organization and add new styles of classes each year. They have great involvement with the Beloit College, Rock County Youth Center Services, Beloit Public Library, the what we were just talking about, the Wisconsin Regional Arts Association um, and the STAMP program. Uh, they are currently doing, they've been doing a lot of foundation work to change their name, own their building, and become ADA compliant. And uh, their budget seems consistent and steady over the last few years. Um, they are actively trying to reach new audiences. So they just had a tattoo exhibit, and with their traveling shows, they're trying to reach out to new people in their area. Um, weaknesses, but, and I, some of these are just more comments of comments than weaknesses, but um, I would like to know a little bit more how the, the reviews, comments, and feedback that I solicit, how that influences their programming. They do mention that they do that, but then um, maybe some examples of how that has um, impacted what they're doing. And this, again, is not really a strength or a weakness, just an observation. It looks like their revenue over the past few years has decreased as far as donations and memberships, but they've increased in earned revenue, um, which I guess is a great thing. It's what we all want is to be able to be a little more financially um, stable with earned revenue. Um, and then my only other comment was that I would like to know a little bit more about how their attendance and reach has changed over the years, because it sounds like they're making um, efforts to do that and so that's, that's it. I think Adalia. Yeah, I would just um, 
I'd really like to point out there are not just skin um, tattoo artists exhibit. I really thought that was interesting and in how they wanted to kind of um, expand their audience and kind of um, expand like their general public's understanding of like what art can be. I think it really fostered um, constructive conversations. Um, and I really appreciated their interest in reaching out to youth um, and specifically highlighting and featuring young artists work. Um, and also how they, with their building, offer artists um, low cost studio rentals and um, sharing resources with office equipment. Cool. Thank you. All righty, other voices. Um, I'll just echo um, what Adalia said about the the um, tattoo exhibit. For some odd, the name just escaped me. Um, and appreciating how they're reaching out to the the youth audience. I did notice that, and the majority of their audience are adults. And I would have liked to see a little bit more information about how that audience has changed or not changed. Just a little bit more detail. On that. It's more of a comment than anything else. Thanks. That's all. Thank you. I, guess I, I was impressed by how they were motivated to renovate their exhibitions. Um, volunteer time to do that and resources. I would have appreciated more conversation about the uh, the decision making between them and the business development association that uh, that owned the building before they took it over, and the reason why the business development association either wanted to get rid of it or or the or the association wanted to acquire it. Um, I, I I talk to my students all the time. Buildings eat money every single day. And small organizations often say, oh, my goodness, if we only owned our own building. But uh, I would like to have seen more discussion of their plan to maintain that building, because uh, it would be awful if a if a great organization got brought down by the by facility, by the weight of facility uh, operation. Yeah, I agree, Jim. I, I had just made some some. Um um, cryptic notes on um, what their long term goals um, might be that weren't real evident uh, and um, how they they intend to continue funding renovation um, along the way. All right, it sounds like you are at a point where you're ready to close the conversation and score the sheets. Thank you. Mine is in Dale. Thanks, Jim. Done. I'm done. Done. All right, I see five scores. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. All right, we are moving into the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts and Letters and the James Watrous Gallery. And they are based in Madison. And Adalia, you are the first reader on this one. All right, thank you. So um, Wisconsin Academy of Arts, Sciences, and Letters. Um, their program showcases contemporary art and examines um, science, culture, and pathways for sustainable future and environmental um, sustainability. They're celebrating 150 years, um, and they're sharing natural artifacts, um, plant, animal, and mineral resources um, native to the area, um, really fostering civic pride. Um, I appreciated looking at their video link with a walkthrough tour that they included in their um, supplementary materials. Um, they have five to six exhibits per year, um, along with some artist panels, um, five pairs of solo exhibitions, um, and they're specifically dedicated to Wisconsin art. Um, they have 
pay what you can. Um, artists are not paid an exhibit fee, but they can sell their work with commission 35%, as well as earn honorarium for speaking engagements. Um, they have public and private tours, um, gallery talks and receptions, um, as well as behind the scenes tours and um, video and audio files. Um, with partnerships, um, again, they have the association with the Academy, also the Historical Society, Wisconsin Public Radio, the Madison Public Library, and the UW Arboretum. Um, and they had to furlough quite a bit of their three paid staff positions. Um, but I really appreciated um, the relevant topics that are very timely, um, specifically focused on civic engagement environment. Um, they had an exhibit of portraits of black men and women. Um, and with their accessibility, they um, dementia friendly organization. Um, they focus on having larger font labels in their galleries. Uh, and uh, they're mainly uh, housed in the Overture Center on their like third floor. So um, that has a little bit of, you know, limiting in regards to its location. But it looks like um, they have utilized some outside UW venues. Um, and I really liked learning about their um, partners across disciplines, uh, specifically the Friction Quartet and um, Jazz Composer. Composer. Yeah, that's all I'll so, share. Thank you. Adalia, my uh, glitch, and I don't know that this happened on the recording, but it happened for my ears. You said something about uh, them being on the third floor at the Overture Center, and you said it might affect, but I didn't catch what that was. I just said that it might affect some accessibility just because it is in a downtown location um, and you know not always accessible for folks. Got it. Thank you. Hopefully I won't have to ask too many repeating <laughs> questions of people. All right, great. Jim, you're our second. Three items that I want to make clear. Uh, one was, and and I it should have been clear because it said James Watrous Gallery, but um, this this is the uh, this is an application for not for the entire Academy Wisconsin Academy of Sciences Arts and Letters, but for the gallery program of the Academy. Uh, that's made clear in the budget information where the uh, where the income and expense each year matches perfectly. Uh, that that's an allocation of funds from the larger organization. Um, I did like uh, what uh, one of the things that uh, Adalia, uh, one of the reasons why Adalia might have mentioned the, the third floor location is is a wonderful phrase that uh, I, I have gotten from from this application brand blur. That is people because they are inside the overture, people uh, associate them with the overture and perceive them as a separate organization. And I want to commend them for this statement. Uh, with regard to the uh, to the COVID uh, situation that required them to to pull back uh, their programs this this past six months, it said while our program has expanded, it has not changed significantly since we opened in 2004. During this dark period, we are taking a hard look at our current model. We are currently planning several focus groups and a survey of artists, colleagues, and neutral parties to help us guide future direction. I think only two or only three or four times in the in the other applications did we see someone consciously taking advantage of, of this enforced time period to do some serious planning. And I think that's noteworthy and praiseworthy. Thank you, Joe. All right. Other voices. Jen, Carrie, anything to add, or are you nothing good to say to ditto and off we go? Uh, ditto? Uh, okay. No, I don't really have anything to add of consequence. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you all. Uh, please go ahead and score then. I'm done, Dale.
Donald Trump. It's so hearing the silences of these meetings, you hear sounds in the background and I'm hearing something that sounds like, I know it's not this, but it sounds like someone is filing their nails with a very <laughs> long emery board. <laughs> Oh, I think everyone has submitted. I see all the scores. Awesome. Thank you. All right, then uh, we are moving to uh, the Miller Art Center in Sturgeon Bay. And Carrie, this one's yours. This is my first one. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've had good examples. Uh, the <laughs> Miller Art Center in Sturgeon Bay um, uh, is has a budget at a, just about 168000 um, dollars. It's been an art community. It's been an, um, a museum since 1975 and is open year round for exhibition and, um, and educational arts. Looking at visual arts, it's the, it's the Door Peninsula's only fine art museum. It serves um, 24,475 adults over the course of a year and 575 children. Um, it, uh, the, the applicant does demonstrate um, an ability to really creatively adapt and continue on the, the arts program, um, even since um, COVID has hit. I uh, really appreciated their work examples, which showed a great diversity of programming and shows the goals of the museum. Um, I would say that it has lots of excellent support materials and how it's really trying to reach out to the younger audience in the region. Um, it has a wonderful set of evaluation tools that it uses to guide decision making. Oh, but I did note uh, when we're looking at the tools that it uses for evaluation is it really defines, it can identify what it's looking for, but doesn't always clearly explain what it success is looking for. So I would have liked to have seen some measurable data um, in the evaluation tools. And I did notice that it does run a small budget deficit. It's, it's small, um, although the, the budget overall is small. That isn't really clearly explained um, in the narrative nor in uh, support materials. Um, it does work with an, the public library and it works with a lot of local artists and it notes that the city is developing a strategic plan for the city of Sturgeon Bay and that the arts are a significant part of the strategic plan. How exactly the Miller Art Museum is playing into that um, development of that plan is a little bit unclear in the narrative but they're a part of it. So I'll back off and I'll let Jim, no, Dan. Jan. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, I thought um, overall they've demonstrated uh, uh, a lot of flexibility and nimbleness as they've grown as an organization, um, building small um, um, uh, staff and, and uh, with a working board and volunteer structure. Um, I thought they particularly ad adapted to the pandemic challenge by just bumping up a, a long-term goal, uh, making that more prominent of, um, uh, with limited in-person in options and, and moving to digital options, which is something that they had focused on um, anyway um, as a, something they wanted to, to get to. Um, they, um, I, I wasn't clear uh, where their structure worked with um, academic programs for schools. I would have liked to have learned more in terms of their outreach programming. So I, I didn't see um, a clear direction on that. Um, I thought their engagement otherwise with the community artists um, and having strategic partnerships with the library worked well for them, particularly in their planning. Um, and um, that assist them in, in using some continued evaluation and feedback um, uh, forms that um, help serve their, their long-term planning as well. 
So um, I, um, just final note uh, for a small organization, I thought their marketing efforts uh, appeared uh, fruitful and, and not, noteworthy, particularly for a seasonal organization. Thank you. All right, other voices in the mix? There, um, it would have been helpful. I, it became apparent to me because I became very curious that when I looked at the financials that the library must own the facility and maintain it because there's virtually no money in their budget for maintaining facilities. It would have been helpful to me if they had been explicit about that in the narrative. Um, it, again, as I said with the photography organization earlier, this is in many ways an inward looking organization, primarily focused on collecting and superb presentation, obviously, rather than the program, rather than programmatic connections in the with the community in which it exists. Uh, again, it's that's that's not a terrible detriment, but with regard to the distribution of public funds, it's it's worth noting. And um, whoops, there's one other thing that I had in mind here, if I can find it, uh, and perhaps I can't, and therefore it doesn't matter. Maybe you'll find it if uh, if uh, Lindsay or Adalia have something to add to the mix here. Um, I also sort of echoed, I, I felt like there was just a little bit more information that I was wanting to know. Um, I noticed that they listed that 50% or more of their activities are arts education. I felt like a lot of the narrative focused on the wonderful exhibits. And then there was a couple times where it talked about the youth outreach, but, um, oh, I just got kicked out of, of my, oh. out of, uh, smart, simple. Um, they seem to be having trouble right now. Too. I'm getting kicked out too. Of course they're having trouble right now. Of course they are. <laughs> but, oh yeah, okay. Well, from what I remember in my notes then, um, <laughs> uh, I just, uh, that, that, that was what my note said. Basically that I wanted to know more about their arts education. I did really like um, their sketchbook challenge that they did. I thought that was very creative um, and a good specific example. Um, but just overall, I just felt like it looked like they were doing really great things. Their photos were really great. Um, so I wanted to know more, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> it means they're Thank interesting, um, but I wanted just a little more examples and specifics. Thank you, Lindsay. Jim, did you remember? I did. Uh, uh, it, it's the same kind of praise that I gave to uh, the Watrous Gallery. Uh, they get points for candor uh, by saying the need to pivot in such a quick fashion afforded an opportunity for scrutiny of the museum's program delivery and how it might look different moving forward. Oh, nice. Thank you. And yeah. Adalia. Mm. Yeah, I kind of had most of the same thoughts, so. Great. Thank you. And my page, okay. my page is cycling and I can't do anything with it. Yeah. All right. I had to log back in. Okay. Let me... Did it actually kick you out, Jim? It, it is in, it, it, it won't make up its mind. It won't let me do anything. It's cycling. I've got the, I... I've got the spinning beach ball of death. <laughs> do you, do you want to, um, Dale, would you recommend just getting, closing it out and logging back in? Probably. It actually booted me out. Okay. Yeah. When I logged back in, it was fine. Okay. Then I will go away and come back. All righty. My goodness. I wish I knew why I did that. I'll submit mine. I'm nervous. <laughs> um, this one. I'm trying to find out my login. Uh, okay. No, we've got plenty of time. You guys are moving at a uh, at a good, strong pace, so please don't feel flustered or rushed right now. Dahlia, I heard you say you were a little nervous, so uh, so let me know if you're feeling uh, <laughs> if you've got what you need again and have access, or if there's something we can help with. No, it looks fine. No, I'm just nervous if it'll cut out. <laughs> I know. I know. Ah. Okay, so did my scores stay? No, they did not. I did not keep them. Okay. 
Um, uh, sorry, bear with me for a second too. I'm having a trouble getting back in. Yes. Mm -hmm. The downside of cloud applications, I guess. I've looked at clouds from both sides now. <laughs> don't and encourage. still somehow. <laughs> don't encourage me. <laughs> OK, I, I think I'm submitted now, Dale. I, I did. Just <laughs> okay, yes, you are. Thank you. Okay. Somebody's filing the nails again, Karen. I know. <laughs> Are you able to get back in okay, Lindsay? Still Not there? yet. It just won't let you back in? You mean? You're muted. Oh, I'm gonna keep. It keeps telling me I have an invalid username and password. So sometimes it does that, and then it gets you in anyway. So give it like sixty seconds after it tells you that, and it might take you right into the mix. It's done that to me multiple times. You're able to get in? Yes, I'm back in. Yeah, okay. all the scores are in. Lindsay's the only one having trouble right now. Okay. May, may I take a moment and step away? Uh, I was just going to say we have we have time. So would you all like to just take uh, five minutes and um, and Lindsay, we can add another five if you need a break at this point too. Once you're back in, um, I'll see you all at uh, nine thirty. If you want to step away from here. So what I'm Staying having now, um, <clears throat> Dale, I don't know if you're still there. Yeah. Um, when I log in, the first time I try to log in, then it tells me incorrect CAPTCHA response, but there's no CAPTCHA. Then it shows me a CAPTCHA, and then when I try to log in again, it tells me invalid password or username. So I just keep getting kind of stuck, and I closed up my browser. Should I yeah. exit completely and restart my computer? I don't know. What kind of a computer are you using? A MacBook. Okay. Um, and the browser you're using? Um, Google Chrome. Yeah, that certainly should be a supported one. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know what to tell you. I, I know from my experience, when it tells me invalid password, it's usually because I fumbled my password. But um, yeah, I do I'd that a lot. I just tried to like copy and paste it from another page <laughs> to make sure I wasn't like mistyping or something. Lindsay, it's done that to me. I've gotten exactly the right password and it tells me no. And then like if I just wait 30 seconds, it lets me in. Why don't you close your browser? Yeah, I did, I did try that. But <clears throat> oh, shoot. How is, how is your connectivity where you are? Is it slow, fast? It's looking, Don't know. I think it's fine. OK, it almost sounds like it's responding slowly. Oh. Um, which may be related to the fact that they're having some problems right now on their end. Um, just be very deliberate and slow when you log in. And oh, I am like a delay, huh? 
I'm just going to try to restart everything. Yeah. So I'll, your your MacBook is all up to date and everything. You don't have updates trying to install. Or, that's more of a Windows thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it okay if I exit and come rejoin? Oh, sure. or is that not going to work? No, it's fine. Okay. I'll be back soon. There's always got to be something, huh, Karen? Yeah. <laughs> there isn't a way to have a private chat in the chat box, is there, Dale? Well, I know there isn't Zoom. After being on these lead Zoom things, I really like Zoom a heck of a lot better than I like this. So I'm um, going to ask the guests that are with us to please um, go in and change the name that is in your... Um, that is associated with you, so it just says guest and it does not say your name. That would be helpful. And, yeah, well, uh, yeah, and, I mean, and by, by the way, this... really, really glad to have you here. By the yeah. way, sorry, Dale, were you trying to say something about that? Well, just by saying it, anyone listening will, will get the message, but you can type it in the chat too. And um... no, I won't type it in the chat. I, yeah, just said it, so everybody can can do that, please. Um, Dale, do you have any idea uh, about how you can change your name uh, within the within Teams? How a guest can is the question here, because well, we all, any, yeah, or our anybody. accounts just kind of come forward with our name. <laughs> I don't know. It may not be possible. Hmm, that's too bad. When I click on on any video, you you know you get an option to do a couple of things, but rename isn't one of them. Well, I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, there may not be much that can be done about that. Okay, one more problem with Teams. Yeah. Um. Alrighty. It looks like. Um. I'm going to encourage the panel to please ignore the guests that are popping up for some reason on the larger screen, at least for me, and focus on yourselves. And um, yeah, I think we are two minutes from being ready again. Lindsay, do we still have you? I don't think she's logged back into the meeting yet. I wonder if she's going to have trouble with that, given the slowness on her end. I hope not. Welcome back, Carrie. We're still waiting for Lindsay. As an aside, um, it's my 50th birthday tomorrow, and my staff made 50. There are 50 balloons outside my office that I have to <laughs> run through whenever I leave it. Bring them in. <laughs> see them. And I share it. It's it's. It makes for a fun experience. That's awesome. Yes. You'll Happy birthday early. early. <laughs> Thanks. You will love your 50s, let me assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Oh, that's great. Yay, staff. Yeah, yay, staff. Maybe if my, I clean my glasses, that'll help the process. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Check email just to see if Lindsay's trying to. Uh -huh. 
and I apologize for bothering you at home last night, Karen. Oh my goodness, no problem at all, honestly. But it was a stupid it's, question. No, it, it wasn't. I mean, it's, I'm still, obviously, we're still all figuring out teams and what, if there's special dial-ins or if there's special whatevers. And if there are, we don't know them yet. So we're just uh, going with the flow. Such a challenge with doing this long distance or virtually. I feel so much more in control when there are actually people in the same room. <laughs> I can go into the hallway and make sure everybody's okay. <laughs> or ask somebody to go in and check. Yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. Hello. Hi. Are you all there? I'm working on getting stuff fixed here. Hurrah. I'm sorry. My, I'm pretty sure my computer just um, died, which is devastating. Um, so I'm trying to get in another computer. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> but all of my stuff is on that computer. Uh, I'm not for, so sorry. Not for today. I'm okay for today. It's just uh, a stress for, I guess, another moment. Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Okay. It is the so th Thank you. Thank you to the person who uh, is sharing their computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is an X. Well, and it's a Chromebook. I'm hoping it should work. But so the plus side is, is that I'm I'm back in. I'm still just having the issue of logging in. Um, so go ahead and log in. Let it say invalid and sit there for like two minutes, because literally I have done that, and it's I've put oh, the right okay. password in. It has said whatever, and then two minutes later, it has let me in. Did that just happen? Was that a happy, happy move, or was think, that a? It's a happy move. Know. I think we're in. I can't see any of you, but I can hear you all. So <laughs> just, just happy. <sighs> Not happy, but also devastated at the same. It's a lot of emotion. Oh my goodness! Just feeling all of the emotions. <laughs> well, we hear it to you. Compartmentalizing. <laughs> Um, okay. This is why I'm. This is why I'm Amish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're on Miller, right? I just need to score it, and then we can move on. Is that right? Yes. yes. All right. Yes. And welcome back. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Hope you all got coffee or something good. Thank you for your persistence. Yes. And I have to thank my coworker, Christine. She helped me with my panic. Christine is awesome. She is awesome. Submit. All right. Yay. Got it. Back in action. All righty. Well, that's going to take us to the very last of the um, small budget uh, visual uh, volunteer artists piece of the visual arts organizations. Um, and that is the Cedarburg Art Museum, located in Cedarburg. And Jan, you are the lead on this one. Okay. Uh, Cedarburg Art Museum began as a woolen mill in the 1860s, uh, so uh, they've ad adopted a mission to collect, exhibit, and, and share their programming with the Cedarburg area. Uh, their board has uh, tried to sustain them by setting aside a $1.5 million trust to, to help them operate um, as they gather a small collection of uh, about 49 paintings. Um, and um, uh, continue to do uh, temporary exhibitions. Uh, they um, have no admission, 
So they rely on a variety of activities and, and other sources of income. Um, and they, they try to put on about um, 11 to 15 exhibits uh, held per year, which is what was mentioned probably pre-COVID. Um, and then some major projects that they've undertaken with an 18 month project that um, um, mentioned that it strengthened the bond within the community and, and supported local artists. Um, I, I think this is probably one of the uh, applications that I, I would have taken some exception with, just, just wanting to see more evidence of um, materials that they were um, presenting and producing, um, maybe a list of the exhibitions as well as um, um, how um, their claims to having an 18 month project supported the community and, and uh, local artists. Uh, so there, that wasn't really talked about very much, and I, I even went to visiting their website to to review. Um, there was an uh, uh, exhibition uh, of um, called "Eye of the Beholder" that definitely looked like they were working to um, reach out to beyond their um, pre um, uh, predominantly white community and and do some some um, attempts at diversity and inclusion. Uh, the exhibit focused on highlighting African American art collectors, uh, and then went on in, in the exhibition to show the works. But their didactic material tended to talk about the collectors more so than the artwork itself. Um, and I, I think it would have been helpful to have discussed uh, the um, uh, artists as as well as. Um, how the that programming and particularly was responded to by their and how um, switching to a diversity platform may have helped them, uh, what kind of outcomes they would have had. Um, there was um, an emphasis on uh, curriculum development for art camp. Um, and uh, I would have liked to have seen some more information there. So uh, all in all, it's a it's a small staff. Uh, with a dearth of programming um, and and um, a real strength in volunteers that are putting this all on. Um, evident that it's very eager um, uh, group to succeed. Um, they've maintained some financial st stability by putting on festivals, you know, having a rental program, uh, offering a beer garden during the summer, and in addition to their artistic and educational programming. So that led me to taking a look at, um, they did a video exhibitions uh, and a few talks, but it um, led me to take a look at, at some of that, maybe from their planning standpoint, and um, really um, wondering if um, strategically they might include some support staff as they try to grow, uh, perhaps focus on fewer programs that would benefit the organization long-term because um, I, I really kind of looked at this with sort of exhaustion and, and felt that this this was a good recipe for burnout for this poor little organization and, um, and um, uh, look long term at um, mitigating uh, some potential staff relief and, and uh, as well as volunteer burnout. So um, I think all in all, um, things that would have strengthened the proposal would have been more specific detail about some of the accomplishments. Um, would have been helpful uh, identifying some of the program offerings uh, and how they benefit the community. And then um, certainly because it looks like such a growing kind of grassroots, very ambitious organization, um, I think they would benefit well from uh, some strategic planning that would help them pace that and, and um, um, ease any potential burnout down the road. Thank you, Jen. Natalia. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I really liked reading about um, how they utilize their outdoor space with the beer garden and how they have um, camp on the go artistic bags to kind of reach out to some families in their community. Um, but yeah, I do agree that um, burnout is a potential question. Um, it said they have a really strong volunteer base, but they also mentioned how um, it's hard to standardize procedures, um, and so I think some kind of 
strategic plan or somehow reimagine how they could work on training and kind of um, prevent burnout, but also not have too much turnover um, might help them sustain. Thank you. Yeah. Other voices. I found a best practice for an organization like this uh, that relies so heavily on volunteers, and that was the weekly volunteer newsletter to update all of them on what each of them is doing. Uh, I think that was a uh, uh, th th that's 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 filling a hole that it, that is the hole itself is as you uh, as as Adalia and Jan have mentioned the hole it, itself is a problem, but they're filling it. Uh, creatively, and I think, and it looks to me effectively with the, the weekly volunteer newsletter. Um, their elementary art programs appear to be very focused. I just wanted to give a, a kudos and shout out. I really enjoyed their exhibit catalog for the African Americans Collecting Art exhibit. I thought that was really well done. And I was I was uh, surprised to see that an organization with this kind of pedigree would do a, an annual metal tour. I thought that was fascinating. I, I, I noticed that as well, actually. No. Any other thoughts? Then please try the score. I I'm in. I see all the scores, so I think we're Great. Okay, then that takes us to the um, to the category of, of paid artists and uh, and the small organization uh, within this category, uh, there's only one, is the Land O'Lakes Area Artisans. And uh, they are located in Land O'Lakes, uh, right along the Michigan border up there. And uh, Lindsay, you are starting us off. I did not print out, did we switch? We did, aren't doing the midsize yet? Uh, no, uh, nope, we're still small. I had Francis Hardy next as well. Let me Did you? Oh, okay. Then you know what? I am, I apologize. I am looking at the wrong thing. I, Francis I, Hardy, it is in Francis, Ephraim. Disappointed. And Lindsay, you're still leading us <laughs> off. <laughs> All right. Sounds great. All right. The Francis Hardy in Ephraim, Wisconsin. Their mission is the historic Hardy Gallery enriches the vibrancy of the Door County community by promoting and fostering local art. The Hardy has initiatives that address the needs of the local artist community, the creative enrichment of local loof of local youth and is focused more than ever on educating the public and promoting the visual arts and artists on the Door County Peninsula. The Hardy has been and continues to be a thriving pillar of the vibrant Door County arts community. So they do four exhibits per year, several workshops with schools. Um, I really enjoyed their um, community mosaic project that they talked about. Uh, I thought uh, what was really impressive is their Door County Arts map, which is not is sort of a talk about a non self serving thing to do. I mean, I mean, I'm sure they do get benefit from that, but it really is something that supports the artists in their area. Um, so I thought that was very creative and a good idea. Their photos were wonderful. Um, their partnerships with the Peninsula School of Arts and Clearing Folk, who are also very well established, great um, art teaching facilities. Um, I think that's a wonderful idea, as well as the work that they do with their local schools. Um, I, they did list that a lot of the staff for the Francis Hardy Gallery are also a part of boards in the community, so they are well involved in the community. Um, they like like so many organizations, they I thought that they, they do a lot with very little staff, but also what is a great asset is that their staffing has been very stable. So that obviously will make a difference in their efficiency. Um, very good marketing plan. Um, again, back to the discussion we had in the beginning, but now it makes sense, Karen, where you said sometimes the numbers that the NEA is looking for 
don't necessarily correspond to what's in the narrative. They listen to visitors to the story, but 40,000 adults engaged. Um, so just wondered what the, you know, what, what they were looking at for those numbers. Um, and they also listed 25% of youth benefited, but then that didn't really match um, um, in their narrative either. Um, so just, you know, not, not a deal breaker in, the near, in, in their grant application, but just questions. Mm -hmm. Puzzles and yeah, and if that if there is 20 for 25 percent of youth benefited, I would like to know more about. Um, I mean, they do they do list a lot of work with the school, so just the numbers were just off to me. Um, sure, and then this might be an overall question. Um, I, I very well could be me misreading something, but um, I, it didn't seem that the numbers in their budget summary matched what I was finding. I have, I have, I have that answer for you. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I have that answer for you. Um, you my only other thing was that I'd like to know on um, um, some specific examples again how their evaluation tools have been used to improve their programming. Um, they, they listed that they have evaluation tools, but I wondered how they were putting them in place. Yeah, yeah thank so you. Please, please answer that for me, Jim. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I have two things to say. I'll say the I'll, I'll say the other one first and then I'll answer that question. Uh, one is, uh, I, do, I, I may have missed it if you mentioned it, Lindsay, but um, I thought the, the, it, a very cool partnership was with uh, Habitat for Humanity to place mm -hmm. artwork in the homes as they're built. I thought oh, that was oh, yeah. extraordinarily wonderful partnership. With regard to the uh, budget numbers on the, on the form, uh, on the budget form, uh, somebody somebody picked up the wrong number when they were looking at the uh, 990 to transfer the information onto the form. Instead of the revenue for the for fiscal 2018, they picked up the fund balance. So instead of uh, so the revenue uh, was 199,000, not 265,000, as they put there, and there was a loss of 7,000 rather than a surplus of 59,000 in that year. It was just a matter of of slipping, slipping as they were as they were running the finger down to get the right number into the form. They uh, slipped a line and got well, that next line. I thought maybe that's what happened, but I wanted just to make sure near the beginning of these discussions that we talked about that because I did find that happened several times in budgets where the numbers were not. Sometimes they were using the net assets numbers or they just didn't line up. Right. So please, 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 call, them please okay. call them out. Please call them out every single time that happens. That's really important. So had they had the correct number in there, we would have moved them into the small uh, size, small budget size um, review category. And just to reiterate, the reason that we have these categories and the reason that we order the review in this way is so that, um, you know, small budget organizations are not held to mid-sized um, expectations or large expectations and, and vice versa. And that you are not looking at a very small organization and right away, right next to it, a really huge organization in terms of budget. It's a, that's, that's a little more Jekyll and Hyde and schizophrenia than we can ask you to do to go back and forth in, in that kind of contextual analysis. So um, sorry that that happened and, uh, and thank you for calling it out. Awesome. Anything else to add first or second readers before we open it to the rest of the panel? Nope, okay. Carrie or Adalia or Jan, anything to add to the mix here? I, I just want to comment on how impressed I was with their um, exposure to creativity partnership and getting um, into the school so that every high schooler um, has a, a, a day with art. You know, because many high schoolers, and I was one of them, wouldn't have had that kind of art exposure. Um, so I, I like that, seeing that in the application. Great, thank you. I, I too was impressed by seeing their um, uh, work in off uh, season programming where Door County is such a, a season um, specific uh, uh, or, uh, orientation uh, and reaching out to different marginalized audiences as well as um, high school. I noted that they uh, also instituted an internship program, uh, which is probably valuable um, in, in both directions. And then um, uh, I too was impressed by the, the Habitat for Humanity um, partnership that 
was um, a, a nice outreach opportunity. I agree with all that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Then please go ahead and score. In their evaluation process, I liked the listening session with artists element. Mm. I thought that was effective for what they are and what they do. Dale, I should be in. <coughs> Jim. Jim. Done. Okay, we're all in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Then we're going to move back to Cedarburg to look at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. And Carrie, that's you. Yes, the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts um, has uh, incorporated in 1994, but it opened in 2011. So as a physical place, it's, it's relatively new, um, but has been around as an organization for a while. In 2014, uh, the organization was nominated to for the Wisconsin Governor's Tourism Award for Arts. Its mission is to educate the public about the artistic, cultural, historic, and social importance of quilts and fiber arts. And I think that's a key thing. It's not just a Wisconsin Quilt Museum, but it's also um, fiber arts. And so it's looking broadly at fiber art. Um, it has three key staff and has quite a strong list of partners. Um, it is does have paid, not paid, but is looking at diversifying and adding individuals to their board. Um, what struck me in their narrative, and let's see if I can find this exactly, is a comment that they made in section getting there um, about calculated risks and you know sometimes things work and sometimes things don't but you learn regardless and I think that's an important attitude that the organization takes and so they th they are able to have four shows a year um, they had a, a really uh, interesting and innovative uh, partnership recently with the high school and and doing a musical um, based on quilts and, and 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 art, and that was really intriguing. And they're also really adept at responding to the pandemic and with their programming and um, engaging not just the audience here in Wisconsin, but I think a lot of places with their um, quarantine quilt project, and then moving quickly online to um, offer free Friday virtual chats and able to connect. Um, their audience with each other. And I think those are two um, innovative programs that are worthy of note. Um, so, I mean, the, the demographics of, of Cedarburg uh, are, don't reflect the entire state um, very well. I mean, but they work to diversify their programming and it's obvious in their calendar that they do that. And um, overall, uh, it's a, it's a, Queer organization. And I will stop there. Very great, Jen. Yeah, um, I was um, impressed probably by their use of quilting and fibers in um, um, uh, communicating that aspect of their their mission uh, in a less traditional means through the musical event and. Um, their response to the pandemic, as well as reaching out to kind of an unusual partnership with the Verlo mattress people. Um, and um, uh, um, I, I couldn't quite tell. It looked like they have primarily an, uh, an adult audience um, otherwise, so I, it was hard to see uh, what they were doing um, with, with uh, school uh, engagement or uh, educational engagement. Um, it, uh, tended to look to me a little bit, uh, just looking at their their uh, budgets over the past few years, that 
um, it's like deficits sort of plague them in terms of operating. And um, um, they're certainly looking at other revenue sources to address that. Um, it looks like they they reach out to the community in a variety of leadership roles so that um, and their um, um, quarantine cold project was probably one of those uh, interesting pivots to engage the community in a different level. I would have liked to have maybe seen some video or some more um, or, or something that documented some evidence of, of the musical particularly. Um, since that seems so unusual. Um, they certainly seem to have an awareness in terms of their planning that sustainable funding is uh, a long-term issue for them um, and their, their small staff is, is stressed to maximize their programming um, with such a uh, volunteer effort. Um, so, um, I think uh, in terms of overall evaluation and, and longer term look, they could benefit by having some further um, evaluation mechanisms in place for some of their programs to get some feedback and, and further insights. But that's all I have to say. I, I want to offer them kudos for upgrading the compensation and benefits of the staff. Uh, very important and uh, and not not often done in in times like these. Uh, and for the uh, I can't remember what the evidence was, but I know that there was a statement that indicated that they were engaging with and not just displaying the work of native artists. Uh, I thought that was uh, worthy of note as well. I did not, um, I guess, write this note very clearly, but I do have uh, listed that they did a good explanation of budget perceived deficits. And so I don't know what that's referring to, but um, whatever they mentioned, because we had talked about them having um, deficits for several years, I thought that they did a good job uh, at talking about how that came about, but I don't know uh, what perceived deficits could be now that I'm talking yeah. about it out loud. We'll have another conversation about that at the end. I, I've got a, a question about that too. But I did, um, I did feel like overall that they did a good job, like answering, you know, kind of each bullet point, and that um, just as far as like writing a grant goes, that it, it was clear, like they did a good job making things very clear. Great. Are you calling that out as a best practice, as and when we can hold up uh, to that, or just saying good for you guys? This is a good one. Just good for you guys. Yeah. Good. Awesome. I appreciated how they mentioned that um, since they were kind of ahead of the curve for planning for pivoting to virtual programming, how they helped other arts organizations and museums in the area um, sharing resources and tech knowledge. So I think that's really great for fostering uh, community relations. Gary, anything to add to the conversation before we score them? No, but I've got to silence my phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I don't. Awesome. Okay. All righty. Well, then, there we go. And why don't you please score? And Carrie, I apologize for calling you out there. I have no idea why I did since you led that one, but uh, you know, it's <laughs> there we are. That's okay. Well, maybe that's what. Maybe who knows? Who knows? I think good. all have submitted. I see the scores. Great. All righty, then let's move into the Wausau area uh, and the Center for the Visual Arts there. And Lindsay, this is you again. All right, I do want to, um, I guess, give a shout out to the Wisconsin Presenters Network. And when we travel to these awesome conferences every year, um, this this was in the recent past. Was Wausau the last one? I lose track of the years. I think so, yeah. Um, so um, I had the pleasure of seeing this space in person, um, as many of us probably did. And so that is a 
an advantage of us traveling around to each other's communities and getting to see wonderful spaces. So um, just to connect the dots, if you were at that conference, you also saw this space as well. Um, a mission to engage people in the visual arts and add to the livability of the Wausau Regional Community. They host 18 annual exhibits, over 25 classes, four fundraisers, they have a retail shop, so really a little bit of everything. Um, they did a great job shifting to virtual learning for their youth classes. They had a story time, art project tutorials. Um, they listed that they gave out 1,300 art kits. And I thought they had um, great partnerships in the community with the Marathon County Historical Society, Women's Community, Neighbors Place, Blessing in a Backpack, Wisconsin Valley Art Association, the School District, Wisconsin Visual Artist Guilds, and several other others. So that was great to list that out and that they participate in community-wide events. And then also, you know, going back to that they do it all, they have a good variety of income sources between the art sales, the classes, and then their um, donor base. So that is great for sustainability. Um, weaknesses and I, or slash comments, uh, they mentioned that they had over 25 classes in their last season, but then in the narrative, they had 180 classes in the last three years. So that's like such a nitpicky thing, but it just got me thinking like, well, what year did they have like so many classes? Because, you know, that would only equal 75 if they did about 25 every year. Um, their strategic plan included, uh, the strategic plan was good. It just included the kind of the first page where it lists the goals. I would have liked to maybe see like, what are those strategies for those goals? So to take it a, a step further, maybe they have that and just wasn't included. But if they, if they do have that and didn't include it, that would be a great thing um, to see. Uh, and then just a little, again, a little more specifics on some of the themes of the exhibits. Their support material obviously included that with the exhibit schedule and kind of listed like this, these were the exhibits, but maybe some highlights of some of their favorites um, just to help build that picture of the organization overall. And mm -hmm. then again, I noticed a situation where the budget numbers used, um, they were using their net assets um, instead of revenue is what I had down for my note. Okay, thank you. All righty. Great. Then our secondary reader on this one is Adalia. Thank you. Yeah, um, I really want to commend them on their distribution for the art kits, specifically um, partnering with the women's shelters, homeless shelters, um, specifically those like impacted most, I think, by the pandemic. Um, I agree. I think my biggest kind of instructive comment is I would have loved to see um, some action items of how they're going to achieve the goals that they mentioned in their um, strategic plan and how frequently they, you know, check in with that um, throughout the year or throughout, you know, multiple <laughs> years. Um, I just think that would help them with their programmings. As they mentioned, they want to kind of rebrand themselves and being more inclusive. Um, I think, you know, they mentioned that they track the attendance and demographics and zip code, but through their, I think, gift shop information, but um, I think seeing how they can incorporate that more would be helpful. Thank you. All right, other voices in the mix? I agree that uh, that they should be commended for the effort to rebrand, to be more welcoming to minority and, and underserved individuals. I think that was the way they put it. Uh, but it's important to recognize that rebranding is not engaging and uh, and they should have a plan to engage with the communities that they want to. Uh, uh, the, the, the brand is not is not the only issue. Uh, engagement and trust building is. Um, so I think that uh, and I'm not saying that they're not doing that, but but to call it rebranding was is an inadequate uh, way to, to think about it. Um, uh, I want to commend them for uh, for on a regular basis hosting the seventh congressional district art show. I think we had a couple of other organizations that support their congressmen's uh, uh, work in that way or their congresspersons' work. Uh, I would like would have liked to see more. They had a good plan for <laughs> planning. Their their description of how the board plans to do its work made great sense to me. 
Um, uh, there could have been more follow through, uh, as was mentioned before, in the strategic plan itself as to show what that what that does. But the uh, the, the way in which they say they put together their season uh, makes sense. Thank you. Dan or Carrie? I just um, made a couple of cryptic notes um, uh, on their uh, projects and lesson plans that were uh, distributed to the community as, as being notable. Um, I thought their offerings during COVID uh, demonstrated their some ability to continue a, uh, and maintain a virtual presence. Uh, if nothing else, um, they do acknowledge that they have a small staff that, that um, has kind of blended positions that seem to allow them um, flexibility that they need to um, maintain their presence um, in the pandemic. Um, and uh, I agree that that um, uh, more detail would have been nice and, and a focus for the strategic plan. Um, uh, would have been helpful. So, simple comments. Thank you. Uh, all my comments seem to fall somewhere in there. I just had an, an additional one in my notes. Um, would like to have seen some more highlight of the partnerships that the organization is able to um, use to extend what it's able to Thank you. All right, and Jim, yeah. I, I sorry, I do say I do want to call out. Um, uh, I think it was Adalia who talked about the art kits. Um, a, a lot of organizations distributed art kits uh, during the spring, but they delivered thirteen. They distributed thirteen hundred art kits. That I think is an order of magnitude higher than most of the other organizations we saw. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And if that is completing the discussion, go ahead and score. I'm in, Dale. I'm in, too. I always forget. It always takes Jim to remind me that I've got to say something. <laughs> they all seem to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, should be quiet then. <laughs> should be there. Okay. Awesome. Then let's go to uh, Appleton and the Trout Museum of Art. And Carrie, you're going to lead us in that one. Yes, the, the Trout Museum of Art um, comes out of the Appleton Artist Guild, which was established. Oh, back in 1960, um, <coughs> the Trout Museum of Art, when Dr. Monroe and Sandra gifted um, uh, their collection to the Appleton Art Center along with an endowment um, in 2010. So um, it is an organization that its goal is to connect and empower people through creative experiences and the visual arts. The application did provide um, a really detailed uh, list of what it's been doing. Um, and one of the one of the comments would be um, it, it focused, you know, it provided a, a very detailed list and its current capabilities. Um, I would have liked to have seen um, my note says is focus as much on the pre pandemic capabilities as current capabilities. Um, and so the impact you have made since the pandemic. And I think what that really what I, what I really was feeling when I was reading the application is that there was um, a, a bit of a, a focus on what but hasn't happened and what has been lost. Um, but I think there also needs to be an attention to what they've been able to continue to do and how they can serve their community. And I would like to have seen um, more support materials that show really the range of what they've been doing um, both before the pandemic and then since. And I think I was in the wrong notes. Um, I 
does have a number of many nonprofit and public partners um, and is a strong advocate for the public value of art. That is one of the strengths that I saw in the application. Um, Two I did notice, but I was really struck with how it is able to bring art um, to typically underrepresented um, audiences, um, in particular juveniles in the justice system, adults with memory loss, and people with disabilities. Um, so I would like to have seen again about how some of that kind of programming, which is very strong prior to the pandemic, about how it, they've been able to shift it since then. And I'll let my voice drop there. And um, awesome. Jen. Thank you. Great. I, I thought their um, move to integrate Wisconsin artists with their learning connection for the community was a, a positive move for the museum, even though they have a desire to bring acclaimed artists to attract uh, a, a higher visitation. Um, I thought the quality of the program um, was more evident when they could engage the artists with the community, uh, either through their Zoom sessions or um, some, some other public platform. Um, and and deal with with uh, contemporary art, living artists. Uh, the um, have started um, storing some of their productions to leave some things available for the community. So I thought this started an opportunity to build stronger educational initiatives as they they stored some of their video recordings that they were creating, and then the introduction of QR codes um, on site for their interpretation use for audiences. Um, long, long been in use in the museum field, but nice to um, see evidence of um, uh, additional interpretation of visual material. Um, so I just want to call that out. Um, the, economically, the, the organization has certainly uh, suffered some financial losses uh, in the last three years, and the pandemic is certainly not helping them. Um, and I just sort of wondered with their um, exhibition model that perhaps maybe readjusting and, and taking a look at a, um, their their present model that that might be um, more helpful in easing expenses for long term. Um, I, there's, um, I think, a strong incentive to uh, continue with uh, outside educational partners and programs that serve an underserved aspect of the community. Um, and um, um, I um, am not sure there's there's um, evidence of, of uh, community involvement by their director. I'm not too sure how that actually translates to their board, but I think they financially would benefit by making sure that there's there's strong outreach in um, all of those areas. Um, I thought their strategic plan looked particularly ambitious. Um, I, I would have liked to uh, have maybe more clarity on uh, understanding how their action steps were defined and, and um, uh, executed um, to, to achieve success. So um, overall, um, I would have looked for maybe stronger exhibition examples and information and input on programming um, and then define a clear strategic niche um, overall. Um, I think um, it was kind of a void. So that's it. Thank you, Jan. All right. Adalia or Jim or Lindsay. I thought it was interesting to hear about their um, refund redo policy and how um, if you know folks didn't have the experience they wanted that they had another opportunity. Um, I think that shows that they really care about feedback um, and the reputation. Thank you. Um, Jan mentioned the uh, the deficits, and I thought that they did a they did a good job explaining how they are dealing with those deficits. 
but I I wondered if they could dig a little bit deeper or, or give us a little more information about um, how they came about those deficits each year. Um, because if they know why they have deficits, they can work to uh, limit those. Um, so I would have liked more information on that. And um, I did think it was interesting. I didn't really see this on any other organization that they the way that they calculate their costs per person reached. Mm. Um, I had just never seen something like that before. So I thought that was an interesting document that I want to look more closely at and see if, if any of that makes sense for something that we do. So that was neat. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, I want to emphasize something that that uh, Jan said and then something that Lindsay said, and go a little deeper. Um, first of all, uh, I, this this statement made uh, I, I think deserves uh, extraordinary kudos uh, for an organization to pivot like this. COVID nineteen opened our eyes. We quick, quickly recognized the needs of our artist friends who were struggling financially during the crisis. That's when we changed our exhibition strategy for the fine, for the time being to focus on Wisconsin and regional artists. I, I think that uh, other organizations have, have done things to help artists through the, uh, uh, through the pandemic, through the pandemic, but not, not very many have, have essentially changed their mission. Uh, and I think that that's pretty extraordinary stuff. Uh, with regard with regard to what Lindsay said, um, I, I too was concerned about the budget uh, shift is essentially borrowing from the future to pay for the past, which is what a line of credit does is not a sustainable way of managing deficits. Uh, and I was very concerned for them at that point. Uh, however, when I went into the um, when I went into their uh, audit, audited financials, I noticed a couple of things. First is that they're, the rent that they collect, and I assume much of it is for the studios and perhaps some of it is for the very fine work that they do uh, offering uh, logistical and, and behind the scenes support to, uh, to other arts organizations in town through the building for the arts. Uh, their rent of $26,000 approximately equals their, their occupancy costs, their annual occupancy costs. I, I hope that it's deliberate. Frankly, that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, they also have a six hundred nineteen thousand dollar community foundation that is on their books, community foundation uh, uh, endowment that is on their books. That's board designated, but they have a they also have something that's off the books that wasn't made clear in the discussion, and that is a million dollar endowment from the from the Trout family for the care of the collection. And because if the collection ever moved to somebody else, that endowment would go with it, it does not appear on their books. And that actually makes their finances more solid than I had expected them to be uh, based upon the other information that they gave us. Thank you for digging a little deeper on that. Sometimes there's some forensics involved, which is lovely. Appreciate that. Anything else for the discussion before uh, before we score? The notes on uh, uh, on audit report. <laughs> well, and on that note. Person. Thank you. Okay, I'm in. Got to find my checkbox. I'm in. Okay, I think that's all of them. Great. All right, thank you. And now we are going to uh, head up north of Appleton into the uh, Land Lakes region, the Land Lakes specifically along the border of Michigan, um, uh, where I was over eager to go earlier. We are now in the realm of paid artists, small budget organization, uh, the Land Lake Area Artisans. Go ahead, Lindsay. 
All right, welcome to the Land of Lakes. I don't know, <laughs> just makes me happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's totally arbitrary, it doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, why I'm happy, it just makes me happy. Uh, <laughs> maybe I need more coffee. Uh, Land Lakes Artist is dedicated to promoting the arts in northern Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Lola will support local artists in fulfilling their artistic potential while also bringing enrichment, arts education, and beautification to the people of the area, which contributes to the vitality of the larger community. They um, mostly host art classes, but they also have seven free music-related events, a reader's theater, um, they do performance arts and youth dance with 191 events total, which I thought was astonishing based on their budget size to have that many events per year is amazing. And they continue to add new programs year after year. They are involved in public art and community events in their community. They, they listed that they have been doing some virtual things during COVID, um, like the, they already had outdoor concerts uh, in years prior, but they converted those to like the the drive-in like car kind of concerts. Um, they recently paid off the mortgage on their building early. So way to go, that's exciting. Um, they have lots of collaborations with the alley, the elementary schools, uh, churches, libraries, town hall, a community garden, um, VFW post, uh, and another gallery in the area. Um, they uh, had what a, a specific class that I wanted to point out that I thought was wonderful was uh, with the Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. Um, I thought that was great because of the history of the area and they mentioned that they have a, a relatively strong Native American population in that area. So it's great that they're trying to represent the diversity that's there. Um, they did a great job breaking down um, the last three years of their attendance and how events have changed from year to year. And, um, and it has shown that the organization is growing in its reach. Um, with in that area, having such a small yearly population, um, this organization is great and important for um, the boost to the economy um, seasonally. So they are playing an important role in their area. Two minutes. Uh, really quickly on the weaknesses, um, they have two new staff members that started in 2020, so there's staff changeover, and that's always going to bring some challenges. Um, and they're in the process of restructuring their organizational plan with that new staff in mind. So I guess that's a positive, is that they're, you know, they, they know that they're in a growing year. Um, after reading other parts of the narrative, I understood that the surplus in 2018 was due to the campaign to purchase the building. Um, but it would have been helpful just to mention that again in the, the space provided in the budget explanation section, um, just to make that a little more easy to understand. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, Jim. Uh, the, the, the building being paid off worked for and against them, uh, or works for and against them. The, the four is obviously they don't have the mortgage payment anymore and they have an apartment for visiting artists and for the interns. Although I, I wonder if the intern has to vacate if a visiting artist comes in, just, just asking. Um, uh, they're, and they're located in the center of town. So it's obviously, obviously a good place for, uh, for an organization like this to be, but now they own a building and they need more classroom space. So so the building uh, liberates them in one sense and constrains them in another, and that's what buildings do. Um, it's uh, they're a mixed blessing. Uh, I I thought that uh, for for an organization of of this size in this in this community, uh, for them to measure their economic impact of two hundred thousand a year uh, was, uh, was noteworthy. Uh, for them to move their virtual art classes to Facebook Live and YouTube. Uh, and, and that just may be a bias. Of course, people who are in rural areas understand, uh, understand, uh, technology better than I do, but I found it remarkable in this context. Um, I think those are my major comments. Thank you. All right. Other voices. This is more of a comment. Maybe it's maybe it's just a curiosity factor on my part. Um, but it's a very seasonal audience or a seasonal demographic. I mean, there's a, a difference in the 
employer demographic and the seasonal demographic. And so I was just wondering how programming shifted and how they just have changed that. So I, don't, I didn't see that in evidence so much that this kind of programming works this year for this kind of demographic and for our year round audience. Those who live here, we focus more on this. So that's just more of a curiosity. Thank you. Jan or Adalia? I don't have anything else to, okay. to add. I just love their emphasis on um, multi generational activities, and I liked reading about um, their porch songs and their kind of free music. Thank you. And Lindsay, I just had a quick clarification question. Um, wondering if when you said that, when you observed that they have two things, had sort of headed the section, just that you were concerned that during this amazingly wild time, they're, they're adjusting in that way as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if weakness is the right word for that. That's just how I have separated my, my comments. It was an observation in knowing anytime you have staff changeover and, um, and for a small organization to have that much staff changeover in one year is, is a challenge. So that's not necessarily anything bad that they're doing. It's just something to observe. Thank you. Awesome. That. Appreciate that. Um, Go ahead. I was looking at my comments again. Um, and saying, no, noting that the planning process is really clearly described, and even with a, a new executive director, the process itself didn't seem like it was going to be affected that much. I think that's important to know too that they have it set up so they can adjust to the personnel changes. Great. All righty. Well, if that is uh, if that's the the extent of the comments, fantastic. Thank you. Go ahead and score it. Okay. I see them all. Thank you. All righty. Well, we have reached the well-deserved break, formally, the formal break, the planned break. <laughs> so, uh, so Lindsay, may you enjoy this one without the added stress that you had before, and uh, and let's connect back at uh, at ten forty. I believe that's what we have on the agenda here. Yep. All right. See you all soon.
Gary, you sound like you're as fast on the keyboard as I am. If that's you typing.
I apologize. Why, why are you apologizing? For keeping you all waiting. You're all here. It's 1040 on the dot. And uh, and I think we can uh, kick this off. And Jan, this is a this is a marathon for you, my friend. And so <laughs> here we go. The Charles uh, so Alice. Me as I shuffle between notes, papers, and uh, of course two, uh, devices. <laughs> of course, we're going to start uh, you off in Milwaukee with the Charles Alice Villa Terrace Museums. Um, when you're ready. Okay. Okay. Um, this is an uh, organization that had existed um, as two historic homes in um, Milwaukee County, the Villa Terrace, separately from um, the Charles Ellis home. And um, within recent years, they've um, uh, become uh, one organization and operating uh, uh, much more independently. Um, so they focus on um, um, trying to incorporate their historic home elements into kind of a contemporary exhibit platform that's pretty interesting. So they offer about, um, they, let's see, they have an operating budget, let me see some notes here, uh, average operating budget of about 750,000, uh, presenting about five exhibits annually be between the organizations and then a variety of programs. Um, so I, I um, thought their roster of recent exhibitions offered a really broad creative scope um, externally curate, uh, curated um, by also integrating the elements of the historic house and the collection. Um, they form kind of a fundamental link to providing um, some kind of intersection for the visitor between their, their mission and, and um, um, the the uh, uh, the historic aspect of the mission and their their artwork. Um, there, I was looking at their information though that would be conveyed to visitors. They do a nice job with artist talks and and producing catalogs, uh, but supplementary information on site for walkthrough visitors. Uh, I didn't have indication of particularly uh, because of the the nature of the type of work. Um, uh, looking at uh, certainly trying to outreach and, and uh, gain ground with other audiences. They have a, a rental program um, and um, a program series that uh, looks like it would uh, cultivate new audiences. Um, and then there are the Milwaukee Mile um, also seems to uh, provide some elements of um, uh, reaching new audience um, through that collaboration. I thought it was um, good that they they formed an outside advisory committee for their curatorial work um, and um, would have liked to have seen maybe a little bit more feedback mechanisms to understand how um, they provide they don't look so internally focused uh, by um, uh, designing those kinds of curatorial elements <clears throat> without um, feedback from the user and <clears throat> and their audiences. Um, it looked like it was maybe a little bit more difficult to pivot to um, uh, virtual programming during the pandemic. Uh, and um, um, that uh, could probably affect their their revenue streams, but um, the curatorial outreach may provide some um, you know, gift in that direction through the, the talks that they could provide. Um, I thought that um, there's um, strategic planning effort could have been helped um, uh, even in, in some kind of virtual delivery um, and they suspended that effort unfortunately. Um, so it would have been nice to have seen and, and be able to plan for some of these changes a little bit more um, adeptly. Um, In terms of community participation, um, I, I noted that they look for anecdotal feedback primarily and uh, verbal feedback. Uh, 
for a few survey evaluations, but um, I thought more relevant feedback from some targeted audiences um, would help uh, develop um, uh, stronger associations with um, their, their Milwaukee uh, audiences, as well as um, a mentioned um, a Milwaukee Public Schools collaboration. I didn't see other evidence of um, reaching out to underserved populations, and maybe someone else may have seen that. Um, knowing the buildings, I, I, I think they've they've done a, a job of certainly trying to overcome their physical barriers um, to um, remove impairments for visitors. And um, um, I think uh, that might be overall. Um, Just looking at their strategic planning, I think uh, had they been able to continue that, um, it seemed like that was that was lagging like behind a little bit due to the pandemic. That would have um, given them a more futuristic look. Um, their marketing plan um, um, seemed to rely primarily on digital and um, print media, and. Um, I just kind of wondered if there were other connections and outreach. Uh, I didn't see any notice of public radio or, or something like that in, in their planning. Um, so I think that's about it. Uh, overall, the creativity of the exhibition programs is really strong and I think worth noting. Um, uh, the um, integration of uh, exhibition and, and uh, education programming uh, I think could have been a little bit more more evident in their proposal uh, at this point in time. So I, I'll leave those comments there. Thank you, Jen. Adalia. Yeah, um, I did think it was unfortunate that they postponed their uh, strategic planning process with COVID. I think that would have that would help them. Um, I think continue to pivot. Um, I did appreciate how they said they utilized surveys of students and teachers and how um, they noticed that transportation was particularly an issue and how um, they kind of combated that and provided some opportunities. Um, I like seeing their the development of their internship program with UW Milwaukee with art history and museum studies students, but I think I would have liked to see um, further supporting materials on how that really affected student studies. Um, and um, I thought it was nice that they used their garden space for art in the garden, specifically to get to those children and family audiences. Um, and how they had some timely exhibits in their 2019 season, um, women artists and non-binary women, and um, focusing on evolution of technology. Thank you. All right, other voices in the mix. I just have two quick things. Um, one was um, beyond what was already mentioned, of course. Um, they said they closed for four months with COVID, and I guess I didn't notice during those four months of being closed, like what were they doing? Um, I'm, because I know like all of us, even when the actual facility is closed, there's a lot of other work that um, can be done. And so I wondered about that. Um, but then the other, I guess this was just kind of an observation and comment too. It felt like a lot of um, information in the narrative was like copied and pasted marketing materials and maybe maybe almost too specific. I think they had like listed the times that the events were. And, um, and so just because of the sheer quantity of um, information that the panelists are reading, it, it's that part seemed um, they were specific in some areas that um, didn't need to be and then not specific enough in others. Two minutes left. Thank you. Tim. I wanna give them credit for a clear informative budget note. As a matter of fact, I would note that as a best, best practice. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, the fact that the two, the two buildings have uh, have separate mission statements is is fascinating and it indicates that uh, their programming is responsive to but not restricted by the fact that the, they're historic homes uh, i thought that was uh, that was worthwhile also i want to give them strong kudos for negotiating the the minefield that is having four separate entities involved with an organization 
two long-standing friends groups that are that are older than the operating company, uh, the county, which which I, I think still owns the building, and a brand new organization. That's that's a model for chaos or or burnout. Uh, and they seem to have negotiated it well, so they should get credit for that. So thank you, Barry. Any anything to add? No, not really to add. I mean, all of all of the comments that I have found in my notes are more or less in essence what has been said. Great. All right. Thank you. Please go ahead and score. I'm in. Ten. All right, thank you. I see all the scores. Hi, okay. Dale, I think I just heard you say everybody's in. Yes, they are. All right. So, Jan, at this point, we will um, wave goodbye to you and uh, look forward to seeing you at uh, 11 o'clock. And, okay. um, and we will move uh, into the Bergstrom Mahler Museum. Uh, in Nina and Carrie, you are going to start us off after you see Jan's camera close out. Okay, I noticed there's an ability to put me on hold in here, so I will just otherwise just. Um, Ooh, I can put you on hold. Hmm. Okay. I'm assuming that you cannot hear us and you have recused yourself as we had discussed and so. So the Bergstrom Modern Museum of Glass um, was incorporated in 1954 or 56. I'm seeing two different numbers at the same time. So in the mid 50s um, in, in Nina, its mission is uh, to educate uh, regional and global audiences using our world renowned glass paperweights, glass collections and changing exhibits. The application um, does include quite a strong list of exhibits uh, that it was able to show um, in pre-pandemic times. And the application also does show how it has transitioned uh, since then. Um, it has art activity days. It has uh, experiences with students. Um, in pre-pandemic times, it was participated ran of art festival, worked with, had art shows, and so was very involved with the community. Um, so engagement numbers are um, 100, or almost 12,000 adults and 1,300 children. So when it comes to comments on uh, the application, I, I, the strength was a list of exhibits that was provided. I would like to have seen um, more variety um, of what they're able to provide and do in their work samples. The work samples are more limited to um, lectures, and it's clear in their application that they do much more than that. Um, so that would have strengthened it, uh, um, more variety in the work samples. Um, for the organizational and financial management section, um, there was a limited explanation as to who was involved in programming and decision making. Um, and the focus was more of the planning was internal. So who is involved? I would like to have seen more of that in the narrative and how they incorporate the community um, within that planning process. Um, and then who um, are they partnering with in the community to extend their resources or extend their programming? Two minutes. Um, other quick comments is that uh, they do show again what they've been doing um, prior to the pandemic and that families were involved in our activity days. I would be curious or I am curious to know how uh, that number has changed, um, how the pandemic has affected that um, family involvement, student involvement. And finally, I think the area that probably I would like to have seen more information on the most would be in their strategic plans um, 
having more um, concrete action steps for how they're going to uh, get to their goals and indicators and but in their plan as to when they've actually achieved the goals. OK, thank you, Carrie. Jim. All righty. I want to give them kudos for very clear financial statements. I appreciate that very much. Also for leading their mission with action words, engage, excite, educate. Uh, those are the first words of the mission statement. And I think that's uh, that's what a mission statement should be. It should uh, it should engage, <laughs> excite and educate. Um, very impressive programs. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to note that they're part of the, the SPARC program, as are many other organizations uh, that we look we will look at today. Um, they 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 speak with distress about the fact that they are needing to draw three times the usual amount from their endowment this year to cover their COVID losses and costs. And I fully understand that, but that's why you have operating reserves. So your your distress should not be should not be sold deep. Uh, you've got a nine to thirteen million dollar nine to thirteen million dollars in endowment funds. You you can handle this. Um, it may it may set set your uh, your planning off a little bit, but it is not by any means uh, a huge disruption. Um, I am uh, I was pleased to note that they they work with Wisconsin based artists who incorporate difficult topics into their works. I think that that's uh, that's a strong element of their programming. Um, I want to thank them for quoting the life study for looking at the, uh, the uh, leading indicators for uh, whatever that whatever that is. Communities do life studies to try and figure out what where it is they need to concentrate to improve the, the quality of life. And um, uh, it's good that they're engaged in that work. Um, and uh, they they are, as most such organizations must be, particularly those that that focus on on as narrow an art form as um, as glass. Uh, they are mostly inward looking. But they do find ways to be responsive to the community within the context of what they do, and I think that that's uh, that's worthy of note. Thank you, Jim. All right, Lindsay and Adalia. I thought it was really great how they mentioned in their marketing plan um, specifically targeted audiences. Um, however, I didn't see um, specific action plans on how to further reach those groups. So more detail would benefit them. Um, yeah, I, I, their mission and what they do is so focused with the glass. I did find, um, I'm, I'm impressed with the creativity and how they, how they program, um, but still have such a variety when like the medium that they're using is, is so specific. Um, I, I did notice that uh, several times, um, cause I, and I commented on it, um, so it must have been several times that there was the same information repeated, like so copy and pasted paragraphs here and there, um, maybe sort of questions that they thought were, were similar, but um, I did notice that, and especially the community demographic was a very long answer, which is great, but it was that information was repeated in another section. So just, um, I guess, being a little more specific in each section, so there's not that need for repeating the same information. Um, and I had made a note that I would like to know a little bit more. There must have been mentioned that they're doing virtual opportunities, but just to know a little bit more about what, what those opportunities were. And then everything else, I think, has pretty much been mentioned. All right. Thank you. Go ahead and score then. Oops, I think I'm in. Yes. Okay, done. Okay, we've got our car. Awesome, and it is 11 o'clock. So 
Jan may have just given us another moment or two just to make sure she didn't jump back in. So we will give her another moment or two to join us. I just sent her an email. There she is. OK, I tried that um, put on hold button that seemed to work well. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. OK, we are moving now into the Marquette University Haggerty Museum in Milwaukee. And okay. uh, Dan, you're our lead on that one. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, the Haggerty is an organization um, exists within, within uh, the university setting, so um, maybe a little different from some of the other applicants. Uh, offers um, ten to, uh, around 10 exhibitions annually, um, uh, providing both resources for the university and, and um, doing a much more public outreach. So it has a, has a lot of strong uh, student campus engagement, uh, as well as targeting the community with uh, K-12 uh, engagement through um, the city of Milwaukee. They have um, a program called Art Across the Curriculum that they've been endeavoring to expand and, and um, that seems to be a, a interesting and, and um, really innovative um, initiative. Uh, it um, uh, uses its collections in, in innovative ways I have for, uh, for exhibition and learning initiatives for the campus population. Um, only two staff members profiled, but there are 11 primary staff members on board. And then within that structure, of course, for the university, um, the administrative staff is complemented um, by the university itself. So they have kind of a unique opportunity uh, within as an organization within a larger organization, um, a mother organization. There are collaborative uh, initiatives throughout the city, I think, uh, are really um, innovative and worth noting. Um, there was one particular one, uh, or several that stood out, one called the Watershed Project or um, um, uh, Water pro um, Project focusing on water um, science within the community with wide public, widespread uh, sort of public art projects, um, engaging the artists, the scientists, and community in uh, hands-on art projects as well as um, various opportunities for learning, uh, targeting mostly an underserved population uh, in a, a seven, uh, seven to 12 school environment. And um, they had a nice YouTube video that, that highlighted that broader experience and, and uh, focus. Um, the, certainly the university structure allows the staff to focus on the organization and deliver its quality programming. Uh, so that's a that's a strength um, for a strong educational impact from what they do. Um, it um, uh, also does um, some uh, besides partnering with the, the university and the administrative resources there to um, complement their work. Uh, has some nice strong partnerships, particularly with the public school system uh, for on-site and off-site programming. 